Hello, this is Holly Sanders, and in this video recording, we're going to be covering the peripheral nervous system. This is for ALHS 1011. In this section, we're going to discuss how the peripheral nervous system interacts with the brain and spinal cord to bring messages to the brain for interpretation and then to send motor signals. So let's start with our sensory nerves. We also call these afferent nerves, and they carry impulses toward the CNS. At this point, the brain or spinal cord will figure out to do what to do with these messages and send a response if necessary. Let's consider the example that you have a cold drink sitting by your side. When you reach over and feel the fact that the drink is cold, that is a sensory message being sent to your brain or spinal cord. And then the fact that it's cold and you want to drink it, you respond by sending a motor message down your efferent neurons to muscles of your bicep to contract to pull the drink towards your mouth. One way to remember this is using the acronym SAME, S-A-M-E, Sensory Afferent Motor Efferent. That'll help you keep these straight while you're learning this information. There are also neurons called mixed nerves that contain both sensory and motor fibers, and we'll look at some of those in just a minute. When we're talking about our peripheral nervous system, it breaks into two main groups. Our cranial nerves, which come off the base of our brain, and you can see here they're listed. Now there are 12 pairs of these, one for each side of our body, and it is really important that you take the time to learn these nerves. They'll affect all of your different programs, and the way that we use these nerves clinically, would we would say uh, cranial nerve 7. And here you can see cranial nerve 7 is the facial nerve. So when you're reviewing this, you'll need to know these by number, name, and basic function. So let's take the next few minutes to go over these very important nerves. Cranial nerve 1 is called the olfactory nerve, and it is sensory for smell. Cranial nerve 2 is the optic nerve, and it is sensory for vision. 3 is the oculomotor nerve, and this helps with eye movement, specifically for the pupil, its ability to contract and dilate. Cranial nerve four is the trochlear nerve, and this also helps with eye movement, the general movement of the eyeball itself. Cranial nerve five is the trigeminal nerve, and this one is going to be the first example of a mixed nerve. It's sensory for our face, the lower part of our face, the jawline, as well as it controls our motor fibers for our jaw, which helps us chew. Sensory nerve six, is called the abducens nerve and it's specifically for eye movement and if you recall the term abduction the abducens nerve helps the eye move laterally or abduct. Cranial nerve 7 is the facial nerve this is a mixed nerve also it's sensory for taste and it sends out motor messages for our face and our facial expression. Cranial nerve 8 is the vestibule cochlear nerve and you'll learn in our next session when we are doing special senses that the vestibule and the cochlea are two different parts of our ear. And that'll help you remember that it is sensory for our balance and hearing. Cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve. And if you use your med term skills, you can break this down into glosso, which means tongue, and pertaining to the pharynx or our throat. So glossopharyngeal is sensory for taste as well as motor fibers to our pharynx, which is the same as our throat. So this is also a mixed nerve. Cranial nerve nine is the most important cranial nerve as it is one that if it is damaged, it could lead to patient death. The vagus nerve is sensory and motor for our pharynx, so our ability to swallow, our larynx, which is our voice box, and our viscera, which is the general term for our internal organs. So it innervates or, or brings nervous messages to and from our stomach and our intestines and allows for our general digestion and regulatory functions. It also helps control our heart rate and breathing. So the vagus nerve is a very, very important nerve to remember. Cranial nerve 11 is the spinal accessory nerve and it is motor fibers to the neck and upper back, specifically our trapezius muscle. And finally, cranial nerve 12 is our hypoglossal nerve. Hypo means below, glosso means tongue. AL is pertaining to below the tongue. This will help you remember that it is a motor nerve 
for tongue movements. Okay, let's take another look at these cranial nerves and see if there's, if I can offer you some suggestions on way to remember these because just a reminder, you need to know the name, the correct order, by number, and the general function. So again, cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve. It is sensory for smell. Two is the optic nerve. It's sensory for vision. Three is ocular motor. It is motor for the eye movement, specifically the pupil. Four is the trochlear nerve. It is motor nerve for eye movement. Five is the trigeminal nerve. It is a mixed nerve. That's what the B is representing here for both. Sensory for lower face and motor for jaw. Six is abducens. It is motor for lateral eye movement. Seven is facial. It is both or a mixed nerve. Sensory for taste, motor for facial expressions. Eight is the vestibule cochlear nerve, which is sensory for hearing and balance. Nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve. It is both or a mixed nerve for swallowing and sensory for taste. Number 10 is the very important vagus nerve, which is a mixed or both sensory and motor to our viscera and also remember the importance for heart and breathing. 11 is spinal accessory, which is motor to the trapezius. And finally, 12 is hypoglossal, which is a motor nerve for our tongue movement. Now you may notice that I have some letters here um, in green to your left and blue here to your right, and we're going to create an acronym to help you remember these in order. The acronym to the left are the beginning le letters of all 12 nerves, and the acronym goes like this. Ooh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet so happy. So if you memorize this acronym, ooh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet so happy, then you could write those down on a piece of paper and then fill in the blanks. One of the ways that I remember these first three O's is olfactory is one and optic is two. And one of the things I think of to keep these in order is that you can smell it before you see it. For instance, if you were at a restaurant and someone was coming out of the kitchen with fajitas, you would definitely be able to smell the fajita smoke even before you saw the tray. So you smell it before you see it. So that's ooh, 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 olfactory optic oculomotor, to touch trochlear trigeminal, and feel abducens facial, very good vest vestibule cochlear glossopharyngeal, velvet vagus, so happy, spinal accessory, and then hypoglossal. So work on getting that acronym down and you can fill in the cranial nerves from there. And then if you look at the blue letters over here to the right, there's another well-known acronym to help keep these straight as far as if whether they're sensory or motor. So let's go through this acronym. Some say marry for money, but my brother says big boobs mean more. Now that one's kind of silly, and I'm sure you'll remember it because of that, but if you get the some say marry for money, but my brother says big boobs mean more, then you could write down whether they're sensory, motor, or both. And by adding these two acronyms together, ooh, 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 to touch and feel very good, velvet, so happy, and some say marry for money, but my brother says big boobs mean more. By knowing these two acronyms, you could fill in the rest and have these cranial nerves down. I want you to take a minute and consider how these nerves will affect your future patients. For instance, if you're on an EMS call and you show up and someone's had a head injury, you may do a cranial nerve test to determine how the injury may be affecting the patient. For instance, if the patient is able to keep eye contact with you and their pupils are able to dilate or constrict, then you know there would not be an injury to the ocular motor, trochlear, or abducens nerve. If they're able to hear and respond, then you know their vestibule cochlear nerve is intact as well as their hypoglossal for motor to tongue. If they can turn their head, 
Their spinal accessory nerve is working because their trapezius is able to respond. If they're able to smell a smelling salt, then you can test their olfactory nerve. You'll be doing a lot of these tests in the field, in doctor's offices, in the ER, in different places you may work. Again, I'd like for you to make a special note of the vagus nerve as it is the one nerve that can cause patient death if anything were to happen because of its sensory and motor to our viscera and the way that it affects our heart. Also in the PNS, aside with our 12 pairs of cranial nerves, are our spinal nerves. Now if you look to this diagram to the right, you can see a spinal nerve coming out between each vertebra going down our spine. And this is nice, our spinal nerves are named the same as our vertebrae. So we have the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and down at the bottom, coccygeal spinal nerves. Now just like the cranial nerves, these are in pairs because we have a nerve go to the right and left side of our body. And the only major difference here is in our cervical spinal nerves. I hope that you recall there are seven cervical vertebra, but there are eight pairs of cervical spinal nerves. And this is because if you look over to the right, our C1 spinal nerve comes out above our C1 vertebrae or our atlas. So there are eight pairs of cervical spinal nerves, 12 pairs of thoracic, five pairs of lumbar, five pairs of sacral, and one pair of coccygeal spinal nerves. This totals up to 31 pairs. And here is a diagram just showing you. This would be posterior or the spinal process coming off the vertebra. This is the vertebral body. Here's the spinal cord in the middle. And this is a spinal nerve coming off the spinal cord. As spinal nerves move through our body, they have to go into smaller areas where they're grouped together and bound as if held by a ponytail holder. There are five areas where these nerves come off. So if you look to the chart, you can see all the spinal nerves coming off of our spinal vertebra. And then in some areas, you see where a grouping of nerves come through. This is called a nerve plexus. And there are five areas where the nerves group together into these plexuses. The cervical region, the brachial region, lumbar, the sacral plexus, and then finally at the very inferior part of our spinal cord, there's a grouping called the caudae equina, which is translated from Latin as horse's tail. So these areas are really important in patient positioning because if you were to put pressure or have a patient positioned improperly where it affects one of these plexuses, all of the spinal nerves coming out could be affected. And you'll learn a lot about patient positioning to protect of these type of injuries in your future courses. So here's some of the most common peripheral nerves coming off our cervical plexus. A nerve that's important is called the phrenic nerve as it controls the diaphragm and as most of you know the diaphragm allows us to increase our thoracic cavity and bring in air for breathing. And there's also a group of nerves that innervate our intercostal muscles. They're called the intercostal nerves and that basically just means between the ribs. So both of these nerves coming off, these groups of nerves coming off the cervical plexus help patients breathe. In the brachial plexus, there's the axillary nerve going through our armpit region, which will turn into the radial nerve, our ulnar nerve, and these should sound very familiar to you as they're named after the bones, so you know where they are. The median nerve, which is in between the radial and the ulnar nerve, and this is an important nerve because it's what's compressed when people have carpal tunnel syndrome. So when that median nerve is compressed because of overuse from the wrist, then people experience some numbness and inability to use their hand properly. Coming off our lumbar plexus, and you can look here on this diagram and see just how thick these spinal nerves are. They are not small at this point. They'll get smaller as they get to individual cells, but as they come off the spinal column, they're still easily visible by the eye. We have our femoral nerves, our obturator nerve, and our savinous nerve running down our legs. Here's the sacral plexus. You can see this large grouping of nerves coming out here between the ischium and the ilium right here beside the sacral bone. And in this nerve, 
grouping is the sciatic nerve. And I'm sure many of you have heard of sciatica, where people have compression of this nerve coming off the, the sacral plexus and experience pain and numbness down their leg. And if you follow this sciatic nerve, you'll see it goes all the way down the back of the knee and the popliteal region down around the base of the foot. So if this is compressed, it causes a lot of pain and discomfort for patients. But also found in this plexus are the fibular nerves, tibial nerves, the gluteal nerves, and even plantar branches that come off in the foot. And here again, if you look at this diagram, are the, the size of the actual nerves coming off of this sacral plexus. So in review, I want to remind you there are two sets of peripheral nerves some called afferent or sensory nerves carrying information to the central nervous system, and then others called efferent, which are motor nerves carrying impulses away from the central nervous system. And the acronym SAME, sensory, afferent, motor, efferent, will really help you remember which is which. Now I'd like for you to take the time to work on learning the 12 pairs of cranial nerves, learn them in order, by name, and their basic function, whether they're sensory, motor, or both, and use the acronyms to help you out. You'll also find some videos on Blackboard that have some songs and other memory techniques to help you learn these very important nerves. Once you've reviewed, please complete the PNS activity, which is not to be turned in, but rather to help you really get a solid understanding of the peripheral nervous system and how it, it works with the central nervous system.